my name is Megan Boyle. I'm the executive director at Bayfield Heritage Association. We are a free museum in downtown Bayfield on Lake Superior. So if you live in the area or if you come to visit, we hope to have our doors open to you next summer season. And you can always check out our website later on. Bob Nelson is our resident history detective, a historian by calling, an author, publisher of local and regional history books. He's a lifelong resident of Bayfield, former commercial fisherman, and forever tied to Lake Superior. Being on Lake Superior at his fish camp in the Apostle Islands with his wife and his dog are one of the highlights of his life in retirement. He considers himself an amateur, untrained artist, and he will be sharing with you some of his paintings of ships today. And he recently engaged in creating folk art paintings of schooners, ships, and vessels that went through the waterways of Lake Superior. So I will turn it over to Bob and please enjoy. Hi, everybody. Today, we're going to explore the wide world of vessels that fly the dangerous and unforgiving waters of Lake Superior, called the Great Guchigumi by the Ojibwe people. At one time, when the French were here, they called it Lac du Tracy. And by today's modern mariners, we call it the Great Lake Superior. So on behalf of the Bayfield Heritage Association and the Bayfield Maritime Museum, we are excited you would join us and hope you thoroughly enjoy shipwrecks and stories of Wisconsin's south shore of Lake Superior. Before I start to speak about the steamers, schooners, and shipwrecks of the Apostle Island, I want to tell you about my real life commercial fishing experience on Lake Superior at Alder Island Reef on November 10th, 1975, on the same day that the mighty Edmund Fitzgerald went down. I was then a 25-year-old commercial fisherman. The fish tug I worked on, he was named the Gene Moore B. This fish tug was 47 feet long, weighed 44 tons, all steel, and was an exceptionally large boat by any means. The SS Edmund Fitzgerald, SS means steamship, was an American Great Lakes freighter. The steamer was owned by Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company. The operating company was Columbia Transportation Division of Ogilvy Norton Company of Cleveland, Ohio. And the Fitz's home port was Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But she traversed the Great Lakes Superior many, many times, bringing loads of ore back from Duluth, Minnesota to the lower lakes in Michigan. She was under the command of Captain Ernest M. McSorley when she sunk in a fierce Lake Superior storm off Whitefish Point on November 10, 1975. Carrying a load of 26,000 tons of taconite ore pellets, the Fitz was headed to the Sault Ste. Marie, near 200 miles from Outer Island Lighthouse, where I was that day. The captain and the entire crew of 29 seamen perished. When launched on June 7, 1958, the Fitz was the largest ship on North America's Great Lakes, and she remains the largest to lay at the bottom. The Fitzgerald overall length was 729 feet by 29 feet a beam. That's the width. She traveled along at 16 miles an hour and held a cargo hold capacity of 25,400 tons. Do the math the Fitz was grossly overloaded by 1,135 tons. And so it was on this cold day at about four o'clock in the afternoon, it was flat calm when we arrived in the fish boat on the west end of Outer Island Light. The radio forecast for that day was gale force winds coming later that night from the northeast. And we set the nets anyway, there was about 6,000 feet of them because it was dead calm and we thought, well, Okay, we'll give it a whirl. So we moved the Jean Moore B and she slowed to a barely moving, located 10 fathom of water, which is about 60 feet. And the crew of Morris Batan, Dean Halverson, and myself, we started to set the nets on a rock reef. We finished setting and dropped the outside buoy in about 14 fathom, equal to about 84 feet of water. Little did we expect to lose the nets that day. Having completed our work and contemplating a rough ride possibly home and setting out about five o'clock, I decided to go up on the roof to tie the extra net buoys down. 
we departed for Bayfield. Now the wind was picking up a trifle from the east, and I noticed that the puffs of smoke from the engine exhaust stack, these puffs of exhaust, we call them donuts, were now blowing sideways. And I thought to myself, uh-oh. I came down from the roof, and Mr. Halverson said to me, Nelson, we'll never see these nets again. Mr. Halverson was correct. We started our two and a half hour journey back to the port of Bayfield. By six o'clock that evening, we rounded the Outer Island Lighthouse and were in the open waters of Lake Superior, headed to a site called Anderson's Point on Stockton Island, and that was about the halfway distance back to Bayfield. On our route, the storm really began to hit. Waves now were on our stern, which is the back of the boat, and traveled from flat calm, like I told you, to about 20 feet of height in one hour. Riding those waves home was like riding a giant roller coaster. We arrived safely and tied the Gene Moore B to the dock. And it was there we heard that the mighty Fitz went down and met her fate. I bowed my head. I faced the east and said a prayer for the captain and crew. There is the boat that I was on. The name of it was the Gene Moore B. She was a 44-footer, 44-ton, 47 feet long, and all steel. And the gentleman up in the left-hand corner is what I looked like when I was 26 years old and about the time in which the Fitzgerald went down on the Great Lake. The Fitzgerald and the boat I'm going to talk about, the Zavona, were both steamers and bulk freighters. They were merchant ships that were specially designed to transport unpackaged bulk cargo, such as grains, coal, or cement, any of those things, in its cargo holds. The other boat we're going to talk about is a schooner that were prevalent up in the Great Lakes in those days. And they're basically a sailing ship with two or more masts, typically with the four mast smaller, the one on the right is the foremast, the smaller than the main mast, and having gaff rig lower mast. And the gaff rig lower mast would be kind of like that bow sprit right there, but it would be incorporated into the big mast that you see all the lines coming off of. Now, a tugboat is just a big, powerful boat used for towing larger vessel, especially in harbors. In the case of Lake Superior tugboats early on, they pulled thousands of cords of pine logs across Lake Superior from Minnesota and Wisconsin in rafts that accumulate up to 10,000 cords in them to sawmills dotted along the South Shore. That's the Bayfield, that's the Dahlia, and the schooner is the Starlight. I think that history can be a huge pile of fun if you have some fun while you're going through it. And if you like to paint, you should consider taking up art as a pastime or as a profession or just for the fun of it. These are some of the boats that I've painted in the past, which tell a history of that boat. It's called folk art and it's just a hoot. And even the most amateur of amateurs, which I really am, had a lot of fun doing it. So again, there's the Starlight, the Bayfield, the Dahlia. And I even did my own depiction of the Moonlight. She was a big ship that's on the bottom of Lake Superior in 300 feet of water off a of Michigan Island lighthouse. Creating artwork through depiction painting is fun. Now I'm going to go on to the steamer Savona and the fate of this famous Great Lakes freighter. This map gives you an idea where the Savona sank and the schooner Alice Craig sank. So I'll get to the Craig in a little bit, but I'm going to start out with the Savona. There you see the Savona when she sunk. Again, the Alice Craig and the tugboat Bayfield. You'll see where the Alice Craig sank off of Bark Point and the steamer Savona sank between Sand Island and that little green island right to the right of it. There's a huge reef full of rock and that's where she got lost in that storm and wound up on the beach. She cracked in half and went to the bottom. What do you see in the Savona there is her stern end. And on the bottom picture is the tugboat Bayfield. She was a pride and joy of Bayfield from about 1909 to 1915. The tragedy of the Savona, the bulk freighter, built in 1890 to 1905. I want to read to you a story about her that came out of the Bayfield County Press 
It's an excerpt from September 2nd, 1905. Steamer Savona wrecked on Sand Island Reef. The worst storm since the storm of 1873 swept Lake Superior last Saturday and Sunday, causing many wrecks and much loss of life. Two large boats were wrecked off the Apostle Islands, causing the loss of 12 lives total. The news of the wreck of the steamer Savona reached here Sunday evening when Chief Engineer William Felipe, one of the survivors, came to town from Little Sand Bay, just south of Sand Island, where he landed with 10 more of the crew and passengers. The steamer Savona was owned by a James McBriar of Erie, Pennsylvania. She struck the reef between Sand and York Islands at 5.45 a.m. last Saturday morning and went to pieces. This boat was in charge of Captain D. S. McDonald and had a cargo of about 6,000 tons of iron ore on board. Savona left the docks at Aloise in West Superior, Wisconsin, Friday night at 6 o'clock. There was a heavy sea running when the boat cleared, but the captain thought nothing particularly of it until he was outside of Outer Island, when the wind and waves became terrific. He then concluded to turn back and seek shelter among the islands. The sea got so high that the captain decided to run for shelter, and it was shortly after we turned around that we struck. Shortly before this, I, I got a signal from the captain to check the speed, but after she struck, I got no more signals, and the engine stopped. There were three distinct shocks and crashes, and the boat came to a stand and broke in two. We blew the whistle for help until our fires were put out. The vessel broke in two as soon as we struck, but there was a portion of the sideboard side rail hanging, and I do not know why the captain did not try to come aft. Of course, it was almost impossible, but they went and made it for about a half an hour before the side world broke. Maybe that he thought that the forward end would stand the sea as it seemed to be hard ground. I do not know why they didn't try to come aft. I wanted to go forward with our lifeboat and try to pick them up, but we could not. And I did not want to lose the people I had. If there had been only one of the mates or even a sailor here to take charge of the other small boat, they might have gotten both off. But every sailor on the vessel was forward and cut off. Those on the rear were engine room crew and knew nothing about managing a rowboat. In those days, guests of the company were often aboard those ships, and they included women. There was a young lady on there by the name of Miss Kate Spencer. It makes me shudder to talk or think of the terrible experience through which we passed. About three o'clock in the morning, Captain McDonald knocked at our door and told us he was going to seek shelter and for us to secure all breakable stuff in a place of safety, as when the boat put about, she would toss badly. It was only a short time before the captain came to our stateroom again and told us to dress. This we did, and a little later, two sailors came and accompanied us to the after end of the boat. We were instructed to put on life preservers, which we did. No one seemed to be especially frightened, but at 545 came the terrible crash, which broke the vessel in two. We got into the lifeboat at that time, but the captain and the men could not come aft owing to the break. The captain hailed us through the megaphone. Hang on as long as you can. We did so, but the sea was pounding so hard that we finally got out of the small boat and into the large vessel again, all congregating in the dining room, which was still intact. The big boat was pounding and tossing. Now a piece of the deck would go, then a portion of the dining room in which we were quartered. During all this time, the men forward could not get to us. Finally, at 11 o'clock, everything seemed to be breaking at once, and by order of the chief engineer, we took to the small boat again. One by one, we piled into the boat, leaving six men behind us. I never heard such a heart-rending cry as came from those six. For God's sake, don't leave us, they cried. 
So two of the men in our boat got out and helped six men get the port boat over to the starboard side so they could launch it. These men then left in their boat and we put out. It was a terrible fight to keep the small boat afloat and to the skill of the second engineer, Adam Fiden, we certainly owe our lives. He is an expert sculler and kept our boat aright when oars on the side were practically useless. We knew we were in danger, but we obeyed his orders implicitly, and he finally landed us safe and sound. Although I am sad to report that those six men aboard the other boat did not survive. That's a sad story that played out many years ago. It was three years later, on July 3rd, 1908, that the Bayfield County Press headlines reported that, now the Savona's wreckage has been removed. The tug salver of the Reed Wrecking Company have about completed operations on the Savona wreck. Two boilers, machinery, and plates have all been removed from the channel. And if you like to dive on that spot, it's only in about 20 to 30 feet of water. And I think you would need to contact the National Park Service in Bayfield to see what their regulations are in diving on historic shipwrecks. So again, on September 2nd, 1905, the Savona was carrying a load of iron ore. She grounded and sank about a mile and a half north of Sand Island Shoal in the Apostle Islands. And then on this map, you can see exactly where she lays on the bottom. See where Sand Bay is? That's where they came when that little bitty boat, they sculled into Sand Bay and that's where they dropped the women and the rest of the crew off there. This is the Bayfield County Press where I got my information. The uh, Savona was built at West Bay City, Michigan by F.W. Wheeler and Company in 1890. And in those days they had master carpenters assigned to it. And this guy name was George F. Williams for the original owner who was C.H. Woodruff who lived in Buffalo, New York. The vessel's length was 300 feet by 41 a beam, and it drafted 21 feet of water when full. She had a carrying capacity equal to 130,000 bushels of grain or whatever, or 3,000 tons of ore. The Savona was powered with a triple expansion steam engine whose parts included three cylinders and three boilers that generated as much as 1,100 horsepower. It takes a lot of engine to move a boat that size with that great load in it. This is a photo taken right after the storm. You can see it says Savona, and the boat on the right is the Ottawa. The Ottawa was at first assigned to go out there and try and salvage whatever they could out of that boat. Here's the back stern end of the Savona in 1905. You can see the devastation that was there. I thought it would be really important for people that are interested in marine history to come down to the Bayfield Maritime Museum and take a look at some of the interesting information. You can see the dioramas of the Savona up close as she lay on the bottom. And that picture is a depiction of her being smashed to pieces on that reef. The Bayfield Maritime Museum offers a lot more than just Savona. We have tons of photos, tons of stories of history, of commercial fishing, of boat building, of the Lucerne, and many of the other great boats that sank in these islands. That's our museum located on the waterfront in Bayfield on First Street, right next to the Coast Guard Station, right by the marina in downtown Bayfield, Wisconsin. I'm now going to move on to the schooner called the Ellis Craig and the fate of this former government revenue cutter that turned into a commercial transport vessel. A revenue cutter schooner originally served as an Arm Lake vessel for the United States Revenue Cutter Service that was established August 4th in 1790 and served as an armed customs enforcement service. On January 28, 1915, the service was merged by an act of Congress with the United States Life Saving Service to form the United States Coast Guard. Today, she would probably be in the Coast Guard family. I told you I like to do paintings, and I did one of the Alice Craig. 
she was around from 1858 and she met her demise in 88. The Alice Craig was originally christened the John B. Floyd. When Nelson and Frank Batan, fishermen entrepreneurs from Bethel, Wisconsin, bought her, they changed the name to Alice Craig. This schooner was utilized as a transport and cargo vessel on October 10th, 1870 in the Bayfield Press. It says, Nelson and Frank Batan Fish Company business is quite extensive, having now in their employ upwards of 100 men in Bayfield. Their schooner, Alice Craig, bought 450 barrels of whitefish and trout one day last week from the Apostle Islands, which were immediately shipped to Detroit and other places east. Each barrel would have about 90 pounds of fish in it. She was a wonderful ship and well-built, but she certainly went through quite a few problems in her short life. From the excerpt of December 9th of 1871, of which my painting is derived from, the Bayfield Press says this, the schooner Alice Craig of this place left for Duluth, Minnesota two weeks ago Thursday, and within six days reached the Zena City. She left Duluth on Saturday, December 2nd at 10 a.m. for this port. Having an assorted cargo for our merchants, and off of Steamboat Island, she ran into strong shifting northeast winds with heavy seas, which passed clear over the staunch little craft. Waves were coming right over her. Captain Nelson Patan had seen it was impossible to make Sand Island, so he turned around and made for Bark Point Bay, about 45 miles from Bayfield, where she is now frozen in the ice. It was midnight when the storm struck her and very dark and cold. The wind blew a perfect gale, tearing away her jib and carrying her foresail considerably. We learned that most of the rigging was broken. Her hold and rigging were covered with ice and the ropes were frozen stiff. So this is my depiction of the Craig in Bark Point suffering through that particular day in 1871. I'll move ahead right now to the year 1887, November 24th, in the Bayfield Press. Ashland, Monday night, the schooner Alice Craig, laden with supplies, was driven ashore near Bayfield and went to pieces. The crew escaped in a yawl and landed in a dense forest. The vessel was owned by Nelson Batan of Bayfield and was valued at $2,500. The cargo was valued at $2,000. Two days later, in the Bayfield County Press, Frank Batan's schooner, the Alice Craig, is no more. The two-masted wooden hull Craig, as she was called by commercial fishermen and owners, Nelson and Frank Batan of Bayfield, Wisconsin, in 1882, was near 58 feet in length, 17 feet wide, and drafted 5 feet 10 inches of water. Here's a rare, rare photo from that period in time of the gentleman that owned her. His name was Mr. Nelson Batan, who was an entrepreneur and a fisherman, state senator at one time, who lived in Bayfield and made his life here. The Craig sailed the pristine waters of the Apostle Islands, ports of Duluth, Isle Royal, and back home to the port of Bayfield. There's her route. A lot of times she would go around the Apostle Islands and pick up fish along the shoreline from Sand Island all the way to Duluth, Minnesota, or she would also go down the South Shore and pick up fish as far as Copper Harbor on the point there. But her main routes were from Bayfield to Isle Royal to Duluth and back to Bayfield. And from there, the fish were shipped to places like Detroit and around the world. There's the Tug Bayfield. I love this boat. Not too often in history it comes to the point where a little community like Bayfield puts together a ship like this. This is the Tug Bayfield. She was hometown proud and built. And these were the headlines in the Bayfield Press on February 18th, 1909. It said here, Einer Miller, Billy Duquette, both licensed tugboat men and Henry W. Wasmith of the Wasmith Lumber Company filed articles of incorporation chapter 86 with the state of Wisconsin for the purpose of establishing a tugboat corporation. The new company's intent was to join the active and profitable log towing industry 
that ran its course here in Bayfield until the available local timber was mostly harvested by 1924. Bayfield's Highlands, which you'll see in the back, was rich in white pine in those days until 1924. This floating tugboat powerhouse towed huge volumes of cordwood, 10,000 cords at times, from the beaches and shore of Lake Superior, and at times ventured near to 70 miles across the troublesome sea to the North Shore towns like Grand Marais, Minnesota, for valuable sawmill and later until 1970s paper mill cordage. To meet the expanding market demands of the local mills, the newly formed company's first task was to build their own tugboating inventory. So on November 30th, 1908, the Bayfield County Press informed the public that the corporation was ready to build their flagship Bayfield and offered this as a headline. Lake Superior Towing Company completes arrangements for a new tug. On February 18th, 1909, the Lake Superior Towing Company of this city has completed arrangements for the construction here this winter of a new tug. The tug Bayfield will be constructed to take the place of the Tug Emmett. The machinery of the Tug Emmett will be transferred to the hull of the new vessel upon its completion. Fred Maynard, formerly of the city, now Duluth, has charged the work, which is well underway. Altogether, about $8,000 will be expended in the construction of the boat, and together with the machinery owned by the company, the boat will be a fine one. April 23rd, 1909, the Bayfield County Press, the new Tug Bayfield, constructed here this winter for the towing company, will be ready Monday or Tuesday and will start to bring in rafts to the mills in this city and Washburn and at Ashland. The Bayfield is a marvel of strength and one of the best tugs on Lake Superior. The Bayfield plied the waters of the South Shore of Wisconsin until 1915. She tugged around Duluth, Minnesota until about 1940 and then was sold to a firm in Thunder Bay, Ontario, where she was abandoned in 1959 in the Kamastiqua River, just outside of Thunder Bay, Canada. When the tug was first built, it was near 72 feet in length, 18 feet wide, and drafted 10 feet of water. The namesake of the harbor city held a gross tonnage of 75 tons and a net tonnage of 42 tons. There's the Bayfield. Her main job was to gather white pine logs. This was near Cornucopia, Wisconsin, where she's got two guys setting the boom logs off on the left and on the right. So what they would do with the boom logs is she'd run those logs around that whole log jam like that, and these guys would come up to the stern of the boat and hook into her, and then the Bayfield would turn around and head for that little island in the back there, but she would take that load of logs in that boom and they would pull them into Ashland or Bayfield or Washburn. That's the Bayfield under power. Look at the smoke billowing out of the stack. Those were all coal-fired engines in those days, steam boilers, steam engines. That's the Bayfield at work. There's the Bayfield being constructed. This would be in the spring of 1909. There's the Bayfield on the ways. There's where she's being built. This is in downtown Bayfield at the turn of the century. There she is getting a little nearer to Deerer. And there she is when she's got a little coat of paint on her. They added the cabin in 1909. Isn't that a beautiful boat? The Bayfield not only was a hard, hard, hard working girl, but sometimes the captain of the boat had some liberties taken, and he would take their wives and families to picnics in the Apostle Islands or here or wherever. This particular day, the Bayfield was on the run. Captain Einer Shine Miller's in the, in the window, and his dear wife, Lila Church Miller, is sitting on the front stoop there, kind of posing for the photo. So the Bayfield was a workhorse, but she also served a purpose as kind of like a family boat. All good things come to an end. So sad that the Bayfield, for the millions of cords of pulp which she hauled, the boats that she pulled, and the barges that she pulled from among the islands, would wind up in such a despicable condition. The owners just got tired of her, or they ran out of money to operate her, 
and they left her abandoned here in Thunder Bay in the Camastequa River, where she was later towed out to the waterfront and made into a dock. Some of my information sources are in the Bayfield Heritage Museum and our wonderful archives we have here. I'm the president of the Bayfield Maritime Museum, and we have some archives down there that relate to the boats. Some good friends of mine were the family of Jim and Marge Miller, and they have a lot of stuff related to the Bayfield. From the family of Burt Hill, we'll see a lot of photos. I went to the United States Coast Guard archives for one photo, and in a book I helped put together called Tales of Bayfield Pioneers, I researched out of there. I did the 1882 to 1935 Bayfield County Press in which I found most information. Then I also got into the 1907 to 1927 Bayfield Progress. My statistics are from the collection of C. Patrick Labaday, and uh, you'll see the link down below. You can learn more about area history at bayfieldheritage.org and the bayfieldmaritimemuseum.org. Thank you all very, very much. I wish you all well and happy sailing.